a very good evening aspirants i have an important announcement for you to know the third prefit batch of shankara ias academy is going to start from tomorrow a total number of 71 tests will be covered under this test batch so don't waste any time just enroll it and make use of it so with this note let us get into the news article discussion today is march 8 of 2023 happy women's day to everyone and these are the list of news articles that you are going to discuss today so without much delay let us get into the news article discussion i hope you all know today is international women's day international women's day is celebrated every year on 8th march to bring attention to issues like gender equality reproductive rights and violence and abuse against women This day also focuses on celebrating the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. And people of India, especially people of Nagaland, have something to celebrate about. Ms. Salho Taunu Kruse and Ms. Hekani Jakalu were elected as the first women MLAs of the state. To be very specific, Ms. Salho Taunu Kruse made history yesterday by becoming Nagaland's first woman minister. So hats off to both of the women for being a role model for the women of Nagaland. Now this is about the news given here. Our discussion today is going to be a little different. Instead of focusing on news here, what we are going to do is we will take a previous year UPSC mains question related to women and try to solve it. Okay? Now look at this question. This question is taken from the 2019 GS paper 1. Let me read out the question for you. Empowering women is the key to control population growth. discuss i hope everyone could understand this question but the key word here is discuss how should we approach the question when the key word is discuss see when a question ask you to discuss it typically means that you should provide a detailed analysis of the topic or issue at hand now let me tell you few steps to effectively discuss a topic firstly you have to start the answer by defining the key terms and concepts Next you must provide some background information about the topic both these should be done in the introduction itself then in the body of the answer you must provide different perspectives you have to consider varying view points and provide reasons behind each view point this would convince the evaluator that you have provided a well rounded analysis and it also shows that you have considered different view points here you can also share your own ideas but you must make sure that you provide evidence or examples to support your idea okay now finally there must be a conclusion that must be based on your analysis of the topic so overall when a question ask you to discuss it's important to be thorough well reasoned and always stay focused on the topic at hand so this is how you have to approach a question when the keyword is discuss So with this basic understanding now let us move on to the question. Here the question is about population control. So in the introduction you can write about the demographic transition that took place in India in the 20th century. You can also mention that in 1952 through the national population policy 1952 India became the first country in the world to launch a national program emphasizing family planning and focusing on stabilizing the population. you can also mention about the national population policy 2000 to add current affairs in your introduction you can write some data from the national family health survey 5 and the recent news about india surpassing china and becoming the world's most populous country in the world if you cover all these in your introduction then it would be a well rounded introduction now let us get into the main content here let us see few points supporting this part of the question empowering women is the key to control population growth see first let us see the role of women's education in controlling the population women's education and empowerment are crucial to reduce fertility rates and control population growth educated women tend to have fewer children as they have greater knowledge about family planning reproductive health and access to contraception empowered women also have greater decision making power and control over their reproductive choices leading to reduced fertility rates so women's education plays a crucial role in controlling the population these points even a layman can write to make your answer unique and fetch more marks you have to substantiate your points with data 
and for that you can take information from NFHS 5 to substantiate this viewpoint. NFHS 5 found that TFR was lower among women with higher education levels. For example, the TFR for women with no education was 2.7, while the TFR for women with 12 or more years of education was 1.4. This suggests that women's education can lead to reduced fertility rates and population control. This is the first evidence. NFHS5 also found that women with higher education levels were more likely to use contraception which can help to prevent unintended pregnancies and reduce fertility rates. For example, the percentage of women using any method of contraception was 47.5% among those with no education, while it was 66.8% among those with 12 or more years of education. This is the second evidence to support this viewpoint. Thirdly, the NFHS 5 found that women with higher education levels tend to get married and have their first child at a later age which can help to reduce fertility rate and control population growth. For example, the median age at first marriage among women with no education was 17.7 years, while it was 23.6 years among women with 12 or more years of education. Similarly, the median age at first birth was 20.3 years among women with no education, while it was 25.3 years among women with 12 or more years of education. So, we can safely conclude from all these findings from NFHS 5 that women's education is linked to reduced fertility rates and population control in India. Now, let us move on to see the role of health and nutrition of women to control the population. Women's health and nutrition play a crucial role in reducing fertility rates and controlling population growth. Malnourished women tend to have higher fertility rates as their bodies are unable to support healthy pregnancies. Empowered women have greater access to health care services which can help to improve their health and reduce fertility rates. To substantiate this viewpoint also, NFHS5 comes to our aid. We can take data from NFHS5 and substantiate this viewpoint. The first evidence is regarding BMI, that is body mass index. See, NFHS5 found that women with lower BMI values were more likely to have higher fertility rates. For example, the fertility rate for women with a BMI below 18.5 was 2.3, while the fertility rate for women with a BMI of 25 or higher was 1.8. This suggests that malnourished women who are more likely to have lower BMI values tend to have higher fertility rates. The next evidence is in relation to anemia. NFHS5 found that women with anemia which is often linked to poor nutrition and malnourishment were more likely to have higher fertility rates. For example, the fertility rate for women with severe anemia was 2.7 while the fertility rate for women without anemia was 1.8. This suggests that malnourished women who are more likely to have anemia tend to have higher fertility rates. Now all these evidence suggest that malnourished women tend to have higher fertility rates in India. So nutritional and health related empowerment of women play a crucial role in population control. The next one is economic empowerment of women. Women's economic empowerment is also critical in controlling population growth. Empowered women tend to have greater economic opportunities leading to increased household income, improved living standards and reduced fertility rates. Economic empowerment can also help to reduce gender-based violence and improve access to healthcare and education which are essential to controlling population growth. To support this also, we have evidence from NFHS5. According to the NFHS 5, women who are employed outside the home tend to have fewer children than those who are not employed. For example, the fertility rate for women who are not employed is 2.3, while the fertility rate for women who are employed is 1.7. This suggests that women's economic empowerment through employment can lead to lower fertility rates and ultimately help in controlling population growth. The last one is the role of political empowerment of women in population control. Women in positions of power can influence policies and programs related to population control and family planning. They may be more likely to support initiatives that provide education and resources for family planning. They may be more likely to advocate for 
policies that promote women's reproductive health and rights this can lead to more effective and comprehensive programs that help to control population growth according to UNFPA strategy for family planning 2022 to 2030 united nation population fund increasing the number of women in government positions can lead to improvement in reproductive health outcomes and can help to control population growth also countries with higher levels of women's political participation tend to have lower fertility rates higher rates of contraceptive use and greater access to reproductive health services so these are all some of the points in the support of the statement empowering women is the key to control population growth but since the keyword here is discuss we must provide some counter arguments also just to make our answer look balanced in the eyes of the evaluator although empowering women is necessary we must also focus on other aspects for population control to be effective here the first one is improving access to family planning services see while women's empowerment can lead to greater access to family planning services many women in india still lack access to these services according to the national family health survey only 54 percentage of currently married women in india use modern contraceptive methods and only 37 percentage of women who want to avoid pregnancy use modern contraceptives this suggests that efforts to empower women must be coupled with efforts to improve access to family planning services the next one is attitude of men see according to nfhs 5 7.6 percentage men in rural india and 13.6 percentage men in urban india use condoms while 38.7 percentage women in rural india and 36.3 percentage in urban india underwent sterilization this suggests that male attitudes towards contraception need to change to effectively control population growth so in addition to empowering women men should also be educated to effectively control the population the last one is access to healthcare see access to healthcare services during pregnancy childbirth and postpartum can improve maternal and child health outcomes and also help reduce infant and maternal mortality rates this can also lead to smaller family sizes as parents may choose to have fewer children if they are confident in the survival and well-being of their existing children so in addition to empowering women these must also be addressed to effectively control the population in india so i believe i have provided diversified view points with evidence from nfhs to answer this question Finally in conclusion you can write about the recent steps taken by the government to control population like the national family planning program the pradhan mantri matru vandana yojana and the pradhan mantri shurakshit matritva abhiyan this i feel would be a well rounded answer for this question if i have missed some points you can mention that in the comment section hope this discussion is useful so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion Have a look at this news article from Text and Context page. This article is talking about the High Seas Treaty. See last week the United Nations member states have agreed on a historic treaty named High Seas Treaty. This treaty was drafted for protecting marine life in international waters that lie outside the jurisdiction of any country. This treaty was accepted during the talks between the United Nations member states during the Intergovernmental Conference on Marine Biodiversity of Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. These talks were led by the United Nations where negotiations were underway for the past 2 weeks. Now remember the member countries have not adopted the treaty formally they just agreed on high seas treaty okay only after ratifying the treaty they will come into force. So this is the background of the news article given here. So in this context let us learn few important points mentioned in the news article. Firstly let us start with the term high seas. What are these high seas? See according to the 1958 Geneva Convention on the High Seas, the parts of the sea that are not included in the territorial waters or the internal waters of a country are known as the high seas. To put it simply, the sea or ocean waters beyond the territorial water of a country are called the high seas. Now according to the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea UN clause the high seas begin at 200 nautical miles from the coastline of the particular country so the issue here is no country is responsible for the management and protection of resources on the high seas they are just governed by international law but no country can claim the management and protection of resources on the high seas okay 
Now, if you are asking me why high seas are very important, it is because the high seas account for more than 60 percentage of the world's ocean area. They cover about half of the Earth's surface. This makes the high seas a hub of marine life. Additionally, high seas are home to around 2.7 lakh known species and many of the species are yet to be discovered. So we can say that the high seas are fundamental to human survival and well-being. And protecting the resources of high seas becomes very important in that manner. So if you are asking me what are all the threats to the high seas or oceans, see as we all know, oceans absorb heat from the atmosphere. Apart from this, the oceans are affected by phenomena like the El Nino and they are also undergoing acidification. These factors endanger the lives of marine flora and fauna. Some studies say that if current warming and acidification trends continue, then several thousands of marine species may get extinct by 2100. Now, phenomenon like El Nino is a natural cause. Apart from this, high seas also face enormous anthropogenic pressures. The anthropogenic pressures include seabed mining, noise pollution, chemical spilling and fires, disposal of untreated waste, including antibiotics, overfishing, introduction of invasive species and coastal pollution. These anthropogenic activities are also putting pressure on the high seas. Now, despite this alarming situation, the high seas remain as one of the least protected areas. As per data, only about 1% of the high seas are under protection. So, because of all these reasons only, the new treaty was drafted to protect the high seas. Now, let us move on to see about the timeline of drafting the high seas treaty. We all know that in 1982, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea or UN Clause was adopted. This convention delineated the rules to govern the oceans and the use of its resources. But there was no comprehensive legal framework to govern or protect the high seas. As we all know, climate change and global warming have emerged as global concerns. So, a need was felt for an international legal framework to protect oceans and marine life. Therefore, in 2015, after years of informal discussions, the United Nations General Assembly decided to develop a legal binding instrument within the framework of UN Clause. Subsequently, the Intergovernmental Conference was convened to frame a legal instrument on marine biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction or BBNJ. However, there were several holdups due to the COVID pandemic. This hampered a timely global response on the legal instrument. During last year, the European Union launched the High Ambitious Coalition on BBNJ to finalize the agreement at the earliest. Finally, the United Nations member states have agreed on High Seas Treaty during last week. So this is the timeline of drafting the High Seas Treaty. So now moving on to see about the provisions of High Seas Treaty. See, the draft agreement of the High Seas Treaty recognizes the need to address biodiversity loss and degradation of ecosystems of the ocean. Therefore, the treaty places 30% of the world's oceans into protected areas. As per the United Nations, the High Seas Treaty aims to put more money into marine conservation. Additionally, the treaty covers access to and the use of marine genetic resources. Now, an important negotiating point during the treaty talks was the access to benefits reaped from the commercialization of resources, especially genetic resources, which were extracted from the ocean. Many developing countries have worried about their due shares from the benefits. So to address this issue, the High Seas Treaty has agreed to set up an access and benefit sharing committee to frame guidelines. Apart from this, it was also underlined in the treaty that the activities concerning marine genetic resources of high seas should be in the interest of all states and should be for the benefit of humanity. The treaty also pointed out that the activities concerning marine genetic resources have to be carried out exclusively for peaceful purposes. Okay, so that's all regarding this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw extensively about high seas, why high seas are very important, the threats faced by high seas. We saw about the natural cause and about the anthropogenic causes. Then we saw about the timeline of drafting the high seas treaty. And finally, we saw some of the important provisions of High Seas Treaty. Since it is a happening news, make note of all the points. 
you can use it in your main sensor okay so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this data point this is a continuation of the data point article we saw yesterday so kindly watch that analysis as well so that you can understand the story see gdp is nothing but the sum of consumption expenditure plus private investment plus government spending plus net exports that is c plus i plus g plus e minus m yesterday we saw how the different factors like consumption expenditure and private investment have aided in the economic recovery today we will understand how the other factors have played in the economic recovery okay now look at this graph chart 1a the blue line is the share of exports and brown line is the gdp growth rate see as exports have gone up gdp has also gone up which means growth of exports has contributed to the overall growth in the economy here exports are outside factors right so even if there is a domestic slowdown the exports may contribute significantly provided there is no slowdown in the global economy but in case if the global economy is itself slowing down then exports may be affected because there will be less demand for goods in the global market now coming to the contribution of the second factor that is government spending see this chart 1b here again the blue line is the government spending and brown line is the gdp growth rate see government spending has also helped in the revival but it has not contributed very significantly when compared to other factors so now we can understand from the first graph that contribution of exports in the recovery was very significant and from the second graph we can understand that government spending helped recovery but it is not very significant in aiding the recovery now we'll try to understand how this happened firstly we'll take the net export component see in yesterday's discussion we saw how rise in us fed rate causes outflow of capital in emerging economies like india right so when there is outflow of foreign capital the local currency value depreciates how does this happen see there is huge outflow of dollars because investors are pulling out of indian economy this means we have less dollars with us but we need more dollars to pay our exports this means demand for dollar is high now what will we do we have to buy dollars from the market suppose previously we were buying 1 dollar for 75 rupees now since there is high demand for dollar we will have to pay 80 rupees this means nothing but depreciation in the value of rupee with respect to dollars what happens when rupee depreciates firstly imports will become costlier because now for every dollar worth of good that we are going to import we have to pay 80 rupees instead of 75 rupees but secondly exports will be encouraged how exports will be encouraged see if you are an exporter of mangoes you sell 1 kg for 1 dollar so previously when your mango were sold in the foreign market you get 1 dollar which when converted to rupee at that time was rupees 75 but now after depreciation you are selling for 1 dollar but after conversion you will get 80 rupees and if you see from the perspective of the importing country they now get more quantity for less price before they used to get rupees 75 worth of mangoes after depreciation they get rupees 80 worth of mangoes this is the term of increase in quantity okay so when rupee depreciates exports are encouraged but this this happen in india for understanding that look at this chart 2 the blue line represents the lost rupee value and the brown line is the exports see as rupee keeps depreciating that is line is moving upward right the export have deteriorated the line is moving downward this does not support the statement we saw earlier when rupee depreciates export have to increase but this did not happen why this did not happen in indian case there are two reasons for this one india lost to its competitors for example any country x was able to provide 2 kg of mango for 1 dollar when we were selling 1 kg for 1 dollar and secondly the global economy was facing a slowdown so even if exports are cheaper since there is no demand goods cannot be sold out by this we can say that india did not draw much benefit from the depreciation of rupee now we'll see how government spending worked out 
see government spending must work towards achieving two things one is demand generation and the other is redistribution of wealth when government invest in infrastructure development more jobs are created more jobs means more income more income means more demand for goods and if government gives subsidy to farmers for electricity it means it is redistributing the wealth by charging high electricity fee for industries so these are the two goals that government spending seeks to achieve if you see chart 3 the government has managed its expenses through tax collection because both lines are moving together but the author says this is a bad idea firstly because india has one of the most regressive taxation systems among the g20 countries which means poor people are taxed disproportionately to if the government is depending on tax revenue too much what will happen when economy slows down the tax revenue will fall steeply right so we have to be cautious about depending too much on tax revenues to make government spending so this is the overview of the data point given here now you can use the data in your mains answer to substantiate your view point okay so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article this news article reports about the damages to the crops in three states that was caused due to different natural calamities this news article says that recently the hail storms have flattened the crops in northern maharashtra region whereas in madhya pradesh the unseasonal rain delivered a severe blow to the wheat crops and in gujarat the rain in over 100 taluks have damaged the standing rabi crops as a result of these calamities the chief ministers of maharashtra gujarat and madhya pradesh ordered to conduct a survey this is to estimate the damage to the standing crops in the affected districts apart from this opposition leaders from these states are demanding for immediate relief to the farmers so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us understand about hail storms from an exam perspective see hail is a type of solid rain which is made up of balls or lumps of ice and the storms that produce hail are known as hail storms now that hail is formed at high altitudes where super cooled water droplets adhere to each other and it forms the layer of ice remember the hail is formed within massive clouds and they fall on the ground when a storm occurs the average velocity of a falling hail storm is approximately 106 miles per hour now moving on to see about the conditions that are required for hail formation see there are several conditions which are required in the atmosphere in order for hail storms to occur now we'll see them one by one the first and foremost condition is the presence of highly developed cumulonimbus clouds know that the cumulonimbus or the massive anvil or mushroom shaped clouds that are seen during thunderstorms these clouds can reach up to the height of 65000 feet so highly developed cumulonimbus clouds should be present from the formation of hail then the second condition is that there must be strong currents of air ascending through cumulonimbus clouds these strong currents are commonly known as updrafts know that the updrafts usually contain ice particles this is because a large number of water droplets found within the massive clouds become solid ice at the low temperatures so the ice particles in the updrafts further strengthen the hail formation therefore ascending strong currents of air should also be there to aid the hail formation and the last condition is that the high altitude cumulonimbus clouds need to contain high concentrations of super cooled liquid water see this super cooled liquid water further gets cooled at high altitude and becomes an ice so presence of super cooled liquid is also another important condition now finally let us see how hail storms form and reach the ground now look at this image given here the occurrence of hail storm begin with the water droplet see the water droplet gets drifted up by an updraft inside of a cumulonimbus cloud already there are a large number of other super cooled water droplets present inside the cloud so these super cooled particles will adhere to the water droplet and form the layer of ice around it as the water droplet reaches high elevations within the cloud it comes into contact with more and more super cooled particles this is because water droplets are at the highest parts of the cloud 
and the temperature is also too low for water molecules to remain in either a liquid or gaseous state. So water droplets become an ice and it aids the formation of hailstones. The immature hail will grow larger and larger as it reaches higher altitude in the updraft. Then the hailstone will reach optimum size and weight to fall on the ground. And finally as a result of gravity, the hailstone will fall to the earth that favor the formation of hailstones and the occurrence of hailstones. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. The news article says that Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins were spotted near Injambakam coast. So in our discussion today, we will see some facts about Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins. The Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins also known as Chinese white dolphins or a species of marine mammal that inhibit the coastal waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. These dolphins are known for their distinctive hump on their back, elongated snout and pinkish white coloration. These dolphins are easily recognized by their unique appearance. Their elongated snout, rounded head and a hump on their back are distinctive features. They have a long dorsal fin which can reach up to 30 cm in height and a pinkish white coloration. Adult males can grow up to 2.8 meters in length and weigh up to 300 kg, while adult females are slightly smaller with a length of up to 2.4 meters and a weight of up to 150 kg. Now talking about their distribution, the distribution of the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins ranges from South Africa to Australia and across Asia to Japan. They are also found in the waters around the Arabian Peninsula and the Red Sea. These dolphins prefer shallow coastal waters and are often found in estuaries, bays and mangroves. Talking about their conservation status, the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins are classified as vulnerable on the IUCN red list of threatened species. The Indian Wildlife Protection Act 1972 provides the highest level of protection to the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins in India. The species is listed under Schedule 1 of the Act which prohibits hunting, killing or capturing dolphins. The Act also prohibits the possession, transportation and sale of any part or products of the dolphin. So what are the threats faced by these dolphins? See the main threat to the species are habitat loss, overfishing and pollution. These dolphins depend on coastal habitats like mangroves, estuaries and shallow bays which are increasingly being destroyed by coastal development activities like land reclamation, port construction and dredging. Overfishing has also affected their food sources, reducing their prey populations. Apart from this, pollution like oil spills, sewage and plastic waste can harm their health and cause mortality. Conservation efforts for the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins include habitat conservation, regulation of fishing activities and reduction of pollution levels. Know that several organizations are working towards the protection of this species including the Indian Ocean Humpback Dolphin Conservation Project which aims to raise awareness about their conservation needs and promote their protection in India. Lastly, before concluding, let us see the significance of the species. The Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins are an important indicator species meaning their health and survival reflect the overall health of the coastal ecosystem. Their conservation is therefore important not only for their own sake but also for the health of the coastal ecosystem and the well-being of the communities that depend on it. So that's all regarding this news article discussion. In this news article discussion we saw in detail about Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins. We saw about their appearance, their distribution, conservation status and threats faced by them. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this picture given here. It shows a group of girl students getting Kalari Payattu training in Malapuram, a city located in the state of Kerala. The training is being offered by the Malapuram municipality to women with the objective of women empowerment. This is the crux of the image given here. In this context, let us learn few facts about Kalari Payattu from an exam perspective. See, Kalari Payattu is the martial art form of Kerala. It is one of the oldest martial art forms still in existence. In Malayalam, Kalari means open space or battleground. 
and payattu means fight or practice or to become trained know that there are northern and southern styles in kalari payattu but the northern style is the most renowned one in the past kalaris formed an integral part of the lives of the people the boys and girls in their childhood would be sent to the kalaris for practicing without any gender discrimination so this is a brief background about kalari payattu the origin of kalari payattu came to be tracked back to the ancient times where it got mentioned in the 3rd century ad sangam tamil literature the kalari payattu gained its prominence under the chera rule during 9th to 12th century the golden age of kalari payattu ended in the 18th century with the arrival of the british as we all know the british brought firearms to india so the use of martial arts has diminished furthermore the british banned the practice of kalari payattu this eradicated the martial arts and its traditions but since india's independence in 1947 the kalari payattu is experiencing a renaissance Now Kalari Payattu is one of the famous martial arts not only in Kerala but throughout the entire subcontinent know that in 1995 the Indian Federation of Kalari Payattu was established this was to safeguard the techniques of Kalari Payattu with social life undergoing changes the position of kalaris and their influence also changed today kalari payattu is staged during festivals and other occasions as a show piece Now let us quickly revise about the techniques that are involved in kalari payattu. See kalari payattu has different techniques. Now we'll say about them one by one. The first technique is the mai payattu which means physical body exercise. See during the exercise the body of the trainee is well oiled. This is done to fine tune the body for the next step that is payattu or fight. Then the second technique is the vaadi payattu or kol payattu which means the fight using sticks this involves defensive and offensive techniques in this stage oral instructions will be given by the guru to the trainee then the third technique is the wall payattu which means the fight using swords two or more persons take part in this exercise the target areas during the fight or head chest back stomach and the portion below the knee in this stage also oral instructions will be given and the final technique is verum kai prayoga which means the bare hand exercise it is a technique in which weapons are not used through this exercise the person gets the will power and physique to deal with armed opponents so through this technique the concentration and the flexibility of the trainee will be developed so this is all about the techniques now note one important point here kalari payattu also has its own system of medicine it is based on ayurveda and kalari chikitsa or kalari treatment this treatment is very unique where the ancient gurus had framed the system so that's all regarding the kalari payattu and the techniques used in the kalari payattu so with these learned points now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion now look at this first question two statements are given here statement 1 higher inflation can lead to currency depreciation See this statement is actually correct when inflation is higher this tends to have a depressing effect on the value of a country's currency this is because increased inflation reduces the currency's buying power which we consider against other currencies so statement 1 is actually correct now the statement 2 says devaluation means that more local currency is needed to purchase imports this statement is also correct devaluation of a currency makes import costlier So the correct answer of the question is option C both 1 and 2. Now moving on this question is about thunderstorm. During a thunderstorm the thunder in the sky is produced by statement 1 meeting of cumulonimbus clouds in the sky, statement 2 lightning that separates the nimbus clouds and statement 3 violent upward movement of air and water particles. So the options given here are option A 1 only, option B 2 and 3 only. option c 1 and 3 only and option d none of the above produces the thunder see the correct answer here is option d none of the above produces the thunder see thunder is the sound caused by lightning the sudden increase in pressure and temperature from the lightning produces rapid expansion of the air surrounding the area of lightning so the expansion of air creates a sonic shock wave which is similar to a sonic boom this produces the sound of 
thunder okay so the correct answer here is option d now moving on here on the left hand side species are given and on the right hand side conservation status are given you have to choose how many pairs are correct here the only disadvantage with this type of question is you cannot attend the question if you don't know exactly the correct answer even elimination techniques will not apply here so it is advisable to not attend these type of questions if you are not very sure about all the four pairs or all the three pairs okay so here the correct answer is option d all four pairs are correct see there are four recognized species of humpback dolphins with a very little overlap between their ranges the indo pacific humpback dolphin the indian ocean humpback dolphin the atlantic humpback dolphin and the australian humpback dolphin so the correct answer for the question is option d all four pairs so with this we came to the end of the news article discussion if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ais academy now thank you for listening